Our hearts work constantly, whether we're waking or sleeping, working or resting, calm or under pressure. Long before birth, the heart begins working, steadily, constantly, without respite. In a healthy person who is not exerting himself physically, not emotionally agitated, not under stress, the heart beats between 60 and 80 times a minute, every minute of a person's life. Most people go through life unaware of their hearts until the heart stops working properly. Heart attack. A healthy heart can pump a thousand buckets full, 2,500 gallons or more of blood through the body every day. That's as much energy as lifting a 10-ton weight pretty high up. This kind of productivity can be maintained for many decades with just a little help from the owner and provided the heart is healthy to begin with. We have just one heart, so it should be checked out regularly, even though a person has no symptoms. Folklore to the contrary, the heart is located not on the left, but in the center of the thorax, with the tip tilted towards the left protected by the ribs and rib cage, tucked in between the lobes of the lungs. When we talk about right and left, keep in mind that when you face another person, his right is your left. The heart is enclosed in a double-layered sac, the pericardium. Inside the pericardium is a lubricating fluid which reduces friction between the layers as the heart moves. If the quantity or the composition of this fluid changes, the functioning of the heart can be seriously affected. The heart, shown here with a pericardium. From now on, so that we can see it more clearly, the heart will be shown without the pericardium. The heart is a hollow muscle divided lengthwise into two halves of roughly equal size. Each half consists of a small, thin-walled cavity, the atrium, and a larger muscular section, the ventricle. A number of large blood vessels lead into the heart. All blood vessels that lead into the heart are called veins. A large blood vessel leads from each of the ventricles. All blood vessels that lead away from the heart are called arteries. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary trunk and its branches to the lungs. The principal artery is called the aorta and rises from the left ventricle. The blood can only flow in one direction, forced by the contraction of the heart muscle and prevented from flowing back by valves the tricuspid valve that controls the flow of blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, the bicuspid valve that controls the flow of blood through the aortic semilunar valve and into the aorta. The valves are critical to the blood flow. The blood flows from the vena cava, the tricuspid valve opens, relaxation phase. The blood flows into the right ventricle, filling phase. Once the ventricle is full, the heart muscle contracts, contraction phase. The cusps open and the blood is forced into the pulmonary trunk, emptying phase. Relaxation, filling, contraction, emptying. At the same time, parallel processes are taking place in the left half of the heart. The left ventricle is relaxed at the moment. The blood flows from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. As the blood flows in, the bicuspid valve opens and the blood passes into the left ventricle. When it is filled, the bicuspid valve closes. The ventricle contracts and squeezes the blood out at high pressure past the cusps, which are now open, into the aorta. From here, it is carried to smaller blood vessels throughout the body. The left ventricle expels the same amount of blood as the right, but with much greater force, normally seven times greater. That is why the muscle wall of the left ventricle is much thicker. During the relaxation phase, 
the blood flows into the atria and from there into the ventricles during the filling phase. These processes are known as diastole. In the contraction phase, the ventricles contract. Systosole. Systole, from the Greek word for contracting, begins. The blood is pumped out of the heart. The right and left halves of the heart work in tandem. The heart can beat for a while without any outside stimulus. The impulses that lead to the contraction of the heart muscle emanate from specific areas of the heart. Even heart cells grown in the laboratory have this ability to contract without outside stimulus. They contract automatically. That is the nature of these cells. Another aspect of their nature is that they work together with other contracting cells to form a coordinated network. That is what makes the heart a functional, operational unit. The center from which these impulses emanate is situated in the wall of the right atrium. It is called the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node emits regular impulses, weak electrical discharges. Impulses from the sinoatrial node are transmitted to a reception center between atrium and ventricle, from where they are passed on by means of bundles of fibers to the whole of the ventricular muscles. If the sinoatrial node is not functioning, any one of these subsequent areas is also capable of producing rhythmic impulses. The sinoatrial node is the heart's built-in pacemaker. It operates at a rhythm of between 60 and 80 impulses per minute, the normal range of heartbeat of a healthy person in repose. Of course, this rhythm changes constantly in response to excitement or activity. Any increase in activity requires additional oxygen, which means an increased heartbeat. At the same time, metabolic products like carbon dioxide are formed in the muscles involved. With its high carbon dioxide and low oxygen content, the blood from the muscles flows into the right ventricle. From there, it is pumped through the pulmonary trunk into the lungs. The pulmonary trunk divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries, which lead to the lungs. Here, they divide into progressively smaller blood vessels, down to the tiny capillaries around the air cells of the lungs. Here, the blood gives up carbon dioxide and takes on oxygen from the air which has been breathed in by the lungs. After this exchange of gases, the blood, which now contains a high oxygen and low carbon dioxide content, flows from the capillaries of the lungs into progressively bigger blood vessels, the veins, back to the heart. The smaller circuit, the pulmonary circuit, has been completed. Now the oxygenated blood flows through the left atrium into the left ventricle, from where it is squeezed out into the aorta, the main artery. Now the blood begins its journey through the systemic circuit. The aorta divides into numerous branches which carry oxygenated blood to the head and the internal organs and to the arms and legs. The further they are from the heart, the more the blood vessels divide, becoming increasingly narrow until they form a network of tiny vessels, the capillaries. Here the blood flows slowly in order to allow time for the exchange of nutrients and wastes between tissues and blood. Through the thin walls of the capillaries, the blood gives up oxygen and nutrients and takes on carbon dioxide and other waste. The blood is now deoxygenated and has a high carbon dioxide content. It collects in the veins, which eventually lead back to the heart. The main or systemic circuit is completed. The venous blood flows from the right atrium into the right ventricle is forced past the cusps into the pulmonary artery and so begins its journey through the pulmonary circuit again.
at every systole, that is, every time the two ventricles contract, they pump the same amount of blood into the two circuits. The right side of the heart pumps about 70 to 100 cc's of deoxygenated blood into the pulmonary circuit, and the left side of the heart about the same amount of oxygenated blood into the systemic circuit. Systole and diastole together only take about a second. At the rate of 60 to 80 heartbeats, the heart normally takes less than a minute to pump the body's entire blood supply, roughly five to six liters, through the system once. But the heart doesn't work non-stop. It rests after every stroke. If you add up all the working and all the resting times in the course of a 24-hour day, the heart is actually working for a total of eight hours and resting for the other 16. Through various nerves, the pacemaker is in direct contact with information centers in the spinal cord and the brain, and is therefore able to respond as the situation demands. In the event of strenuous physical exertion, or emotional upset or illness with high fever, the body needs additional oxygen. More oxygen is made available through an increased supply of blood which results when the heart beats more rapidly. If the heart is healthy, the number of heartbeats increases. The heart also contracts more powerfully so that it is emptied more completely. The amount of blood expelled with each heartbeat, the stroke volume, is greater. Such an increase in stroke volume is particularly marked in very muscular hearts, like those of athletes. The increased frequency of the heartbeat and the increase in stroke volume mean that more blood is expelled. The amount may increase by a factor of two. If such a rate were sustained for an entire 24-hour period, it would amount to 1,400 buckets, 3,500 gallons. To put it another way, the amount of energy used by the heart during this period would be enough to lift a 10-ton vehicle quite high up into the air. In order to produce this sort of output, the heart muscle must be well nourished with blood and adequately supplied with oxygen and other nutrients. The heart has its own blood vessels for this purpose, the coronary vessels of the heart. These big blood vessels surround the heart. Like other blood vessels, they divide into smaller vessels and capillaries. These capillaries form a dense network of vessels that permeate all parts of the multi-layered heart muscle. In the embryo, the heart develops from an enlarged blood vessel. It bends and twists until it attains its ultimate shape. How it develops explains the various diagonal, longitudinal, and ring-shaped muscle systems that run in different directions, depending on their position. This directionality enables the heart to work as a pump. Unlike the muscles of the arms and legs, whose job it is to provide movement, the muscles of the heart have a different structure. There are no apparent boundaries between the heart muscle cells or fibers. Impulses are transmitted directly from one cell to the next. In this way, the entire heart muscle, seen here on the x-ray screen, responds as a single entity. Feeling the pulse is a way of obtaining preliminary information about the activity of the heart muscle. The number of heartbeats per minute is counted. The pulse also gives some indication of the state of the blood vessels and the strength of the heartbeat. 
the pulse is most frequently felt on the wrist. A rhythmic dilation of the artery wall can be clearly felt. This occurs when the ventricles contract. With every heartbeat, 70 to 100 cubic centimeters of blood are emptied into the aorta. As a result, the aorta distends rhythmically. To reach all the body tissue, the blood flows from the aorta into progressively narrower blood vessels. The further the blood vessels are from the heart, the more branched they are. In the dense network of capillaries, the flow of blood has been slowed sufficiently to allow time for nutrients and waste products to be exchanged. Another method of examining the heart and circulatory system is by measuring the blood pressure. The upper and lower blood pressure readings provide more exact information about the elasticity of the arterial vessels and the strength of the heart. The cuff is inflated until the pressure with which the upper arm is squeezed exceeds the blood pressure in the artery. As a result, the blood vessel closes. The flow of blood is interrupted. To take the upper blood pressure, the cuff pressure is reduced. When the external pressure is less than the arterial blood pressure, the blood vessel opens for this brief period. The blood is flowing again. Eddies form, and these make a noise in the artery. The sound can be clearly heard with a stethoscope. The cuff pressure corresponds to the upper blood pressure value. To determine the lower blood pressure value, the cuff pressure is reduced to where no further sound is audible. The blood vessel has opened and the blood is again flowing unimpeded. To diagnose the state of the circulation accurately, both blood pressure readings are needed. The upper, the systolic. and the lower, the diastolic. One of the classic ways of examining the heart is listening to the sounds of the heart with a stethoscope. The beating of a diseased heart sounds different from that of a healthy heart and is often accompanied by ambient noises. In this way, the doctor can detect alterations in the condition of the heart. The position and size of the heart can be determined by sounds heard from the chest. Further information is provided by the electrocardiogram, ECG for short. Emanating from the sinoatrial node, the impulse spreads throughout the entire heart. The resulting slight but measurable electrical currents travel to the surface of the skin. To detect and register these currents, Metal electrodes are applied to various areas of the body. A stress test determines the patient's physical condition. The patient's ECG and blood pressure are measured at different levels of exertion. The tape shows the relaxation phases of the ventricles as a straight line and the excitations as spikes. A cuff placed around the upper arm monitors blood pressure automatically and continuously during both the working and rest phases. The continuously recorded ECG shows whether the heart activity is normal or not. The ECG can be used in conjunction with telemetry to monitor patients outside the doctor's office. The patient is hooked up to a portable apparatus. ECG data can be transmitted over considerable distances and longish periods of time. This method is particularly useful for keeping tabs on a patient's recovery after a serious event like a heart attack.
constant demands are made on the heart muscle, so it must always be well supplied with oxygen, that is, well nourished with blood. The coronary blood vessels surround the heart muscle like branches with so many twigs, but with very little connection between them. As a result, if an artery suddenly becomes obstructed, that particular area of the heart muscle is no longer adequately supplied with oxygenated blood. The tissue dies. The dreaded myocardial infarction, a heart attack, has occurred. If, however, the obstruction of a coronary artery takes place gradually, cross connections can be formed to another artery so that oxygen continues to be supplied to the threatened area of the heart. This is the patient's chance to overcome myocardial infarction. By means of exercise, the coronary vessels can be so strengthened and increased in number that if a moderately sized artery is suddenly obstructed, there are enough alternative blood vessels so that the endangered part of the heart nevertheless receives an adequate supply of blood. It is important to remember that the heart is a muscle and, like any other muscle, can be trained. Not with crash training, but with endurance fitness training. This can begin with the most widely distributed exercise mechanism, the feet. It isn't the speed that counts, but the length of time spent walking. Stair climbing is another simple exercise. For those who don't have stairs, there's a stair climbing machine. The important thing is not what you do, but that you do it. Someone in good health can gain enormous benefits from regular aerobic exercise. Leisurely rowing is pleasant, but doesn't count as aerobic exercise. Swimming, on the other hand, is an excellent exercise because it uses many different muscle systems. After exercise like this, a healthy adult's heart will beat an additional nine times in 15 seconds, 35 or 36 per minute. It doesn't take an expensive gym or fancy equipment. If you can walk, you can exercise. The trick is to stretch, but not strain the muscles. The important thing about exercise is not the intensity, but the regularity. The degree of improvement can be measured very accurately. A matter of curiosity or pride for some. A precaution for anyone not in the best of health. To summarize, the better developed the coronary heart vessels, the better the heart is supplied with oxygenated blood. The heart has its own impulse producing areas which enable it to work rhythmically. Its normal pumping output is several thousand liters a day, but this can be multiplied several times. Heart valves ensure that the blood flows in only one direction. The right half of the heart pumps the blood into the pulmonary circuit, where carbon dioxide and oxygen are exchanged, while the left half of the heart pumps blood into the systemic circuit. That is what makes the blood go around the body which feeds the cells, which sustains life.